In the absence of a quorum of the members of the Victorville City Council, the City Clerk calls to order the meeting of the City Council of the City of Victorville and the City Council sitting as a Library Board of Trustees, Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, successor agency to the Victorville Redevelopment Agency, the Victorville Joint Powers Financing Authority, the Victorville Water District, and the Victorville Housing Trust. There is only one item that has been agendized for closed session at tonight's 5 o'clock meeting, and it has been determined that there is not a need to discuss this item in closed session this evening. Therefore, the 5 o'clock closed session meeting is hereby canceled, and the regular session will resume at 6 p.m. My talk that I watch is a little bit off. Sorry about that, but this one is correct. It is uh, 6 o'clock on this favorite day of the year for most people, except those who pay a lot of taxes. And I'm going to call the regular meeting uh, of the City Council to order. Roll call, please. Council Member Garcia. Here. Council Member Kennedy's absence is noted. Council Member Vias. Here. Mayor Pro Tem McEachern. Here. Mayor Cox. Here. Normally at this time we would ask the attorney to give a presentation in regard to an executive session that we normally hold before the council meeting. We had no items on the agenda tonight. We didn't hold that session and so this is the first meeting of the council tonight. We will start this meeting with an invocation by Minister Cal Yingling and please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance by our Police Chief Sam Lucia. And I didn't ask, I'm sorry, I'm running behind. Is Mr. Yingling here? Right up to the dock. Thank you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you being mindful of how great and how awesome you are. Mindful, Father, that as we approach you, we're mindful of this meeting. We pray, Father, for wisdom and guidance for each member and whatever subjects they cover this evening. Give them the understanding that is best for the community and for those residents in this area. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you for all things that you do and that you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. We have a uh, presentation at the present time. Our two uh, public works individuals are here, Marcos Zamora and Erica King. Could you come down front, please?
I get to do this on behalf of the uh, city and the, and the city council. Um, this is a proclamation uh, for Public Works Day, which is May 15. We're a little early this year. But we want the public employees and all employees to, uh, to know and understand that we appreciate all the things that they do. And I know the public does, uh, even though we get complaints about the condition of the streets, we're doing everything we can to make that better. And people like our employees are working every day to make that better. I want to read this. Whereas the public works services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as storm water systems, animal control, sewers, weed control, graffiti, sidewalks, curb and gutter, streets, fleet maintenance, water services, solid waste collection, recycling, and there's actually more. Whereas health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends upon these facilities and the services, and I will add these employees that provide these, whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and scale of our public works officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work. I, therefore, Jim Cox, Mayor of the City of Victorville, and on behalf of the City Council, uh, proclaim May 15, 2014 as Public Works Day. And from the City Council, I want to thank you and all the Public Works employees. This proclamation is being presented to you. Do you want to make a comment? <laughs> Just thank you. And thank, okay, thank you and thank all the employees for us. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Madam City Clerk, I think we have some revisions to the agenda before we start this. Uh, yes, we do, Mr. Mayor. We have four revisions to the agenda. Revision number one concerns agenda item B2. It's a letter from Ann Hoffman, a property owner. Revision number two concerns agenda item B2. It is a letter from business owner Jim Lindenberg. Revision number three relates to agenda item B2. It's a memo to the council from Michael Sarzinski, senior planner. And revision number four is in connection with agenda item B3, a revised notice of exemption. All of the revisions are available on the dais and for the public's review. And those are all the revisions I have. Okay, any other questions or comments or clarification from the council or staff? First item on the agenda would be an appeal is for an appeal hearing. We do not have any scheduled, uh, but we do have a public hearing. Um, this is a, a public hearing that's scheduled for ordinance number 2315, proposed Victorville Municipal Utility Services gas service rules, regulations, and rate schedules. Um, Doug Robinson, any clarification, anything to add? Uh, not at this time, unless the council has any questions. At this time, I will open the public hearing then on the proposed Victorville Municipal Utility Services rate schedules. Anyone want to speak? I'm sorry, I, don't, I haven't looked at the cards to see if we have a card on this item. And not, that I can tell. No one to speak on this item. I'm close the public hearing. Council? I will read the title of the ordinance, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Ordinance Sorry. number 2315, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Victorville, creating a new Chapter 10.11 within Title 10 of the Victorville Municipal Code for the purpose of adopting gas service rules, rate schedules, and related regulations. Questions of the staff from the council? We're ready for a motion. Um, I have a question. I just want to oh. make sure that this does not include a rate increase is that correct uh, that's correct it's not the purpose isn't for a rate increase so we've tried to keep the rates essentially the same uh, there is some changes in the way the rates calculated 
Uh, we're going from a methodology that included both a summer and winter schedule to a, a single annual schedule. So um, their rates would essentially it may increase during one of the schedules uh, or during one of the times of the years, but it would decrease uh, during the other time of the year so that throughout the year their rate should be effectively the same. There are no further questions. Chairs, open for a motion. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem McEachern, second by Council Member Garcia, to introduce and wait for the reading of Ordinance Number 2315. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. The next item for a public hearing is. Uh, we have attachments uh, to the public hearing that's the general plan amendment, zone change, and specific plan development. There's been a lot of discussion, communications, additions to the agenda, a uh, letter from individuals. Um, before we open the hearing, can we have a just a short staff presentation to set the nature of the hearing, what it's proposed to do, why it's occurring at this time? And then we will open the public hearing, have input, and then we'll follow by discussion of the council. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, uh, following our agenda briefing, I indicated to staff that uh, you had made a request, and especially with Councilmember Kennedy uh, absent uh, tonight, but that you had made a request to continue this item to a larger um, uh, workshop, uh, maybe singularly focused on this one issue. Uh, so the staff that would have given a more detailed presentation uh, it did not come to the meeting. I asked them not to come. Uh, we do have uh, our assistant, or excuse me, our acting director, uh, as well as uh, Mike Sarzinski, one of our planners, uh, who can give a very brief presentation uh, if that's the council's desire. Um, it's up to you if you'd like that presentation or if you'd rather hold that for uh, the more focused workshop. Well, let me, let me point out that uh, when I sat down and went through this amendment, it does a lot of things that's really difficult to cover in one meeting. And it also makes some changes that have been questioned by both individuals who are landowners and business people who have asked for clarifications. I think it certainly justifies a separate meeting because it's, it's um, very far reaching. And there's also been the questions in regard to uh, this sets new rules and regulations uh, for signs, does it? Uh, this needs to be clarified. Uh, a question that it can't be done unless the sign ordinance itself is modified or changed in some way. It's a legal question we need to get clarified. But especially right now when the city council has determined that we want to improve the image of the city uh, that seems to be supported by everyone we talk to, and yet, uh, when we have uh, code enforcement going through the community, we are getting feedback that I don't want this to sound as critical as it's going to sound, but I want to make a point. Almost every individual I've talked to said, hooray, we want you to do it, but not to me. The other guy, my competitor, or somebody down the street. And we can't do that. Uh, we have to apply these rules equally. We have to treat everybody equally. And we do not sit down and try to figure out who provides the greatest sales tax and then give them the greatest latitude. We don't do that. We're not going to do that. That's not the way government should run. So we have a lot of explaining to do because of some proposed changes and a lot of misinformation. But we're going to go ahead and open the public hearing so that those individuals who are affected and even those individuals who are not affected but have an interest in this can come and give their presentation to the City Council. It is my intent at this time to hold the public hearing and then continue the public hearing, not close it, so that when we sit down with this as an individual item, that public hearing will still be open, which means those individuals can come back and give additional information, additional uh, make an additional presentation to the council, as well as new individuals who may not be here, but as a result of this hearing have, uh, have an interest and want to be heard. So at this time, I'm going to open the hearing on B, is that B2, Madam Clerk? Yes, it is. On B2. The hearing is now open. 
Those individuals who want to speak on that item, please come down to the microphone and give your name, and uh, you may speak on this item now. Have none. Since we do not have anyone that wants to speak on this item at this time, and we've indicated that we're going to continue uh, this matter, I, if uh, does this require a motion of the council uh, to continue the public hearing to the next meeting? Well, the question is going to be: Do you have a? If you're going to continue it to the next meeting, I would recommend continuing it. If you don't have a date and time specific, then I would even maybe close the public hearing and re-notice for a subsequent time, unless you have a date specifically, or if you want to send it out for perhaps a month from now, continue it to that date. I don't know when we can continue this to a date certain. Does any of the council members feel they know for a date certain? And since we don't have a date certain and we had no one to speak, then you'd, your recommendation I recommend would be close to this close public the hearing, hearing. And we will, we will incorporate all of the comments. Well, there are no comments, but we will incorporate the staff report into the next meeting and re-notice it. Re-advertise, re-notice for the hearing? All right. Then I want to close this hearing, and then based upon the city attorney's Recommendation, we should have a motion on that. Motion by Council Member Vias, second by Mayor Pro Tem McEachern. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. Okay, it's a but it will make sure that we have all the council members here uh, when we reschedule this and have a public hearing and we will notify everyone who's indicated an interest in this matter. Next item is item number three on the agenda, notice of exemption, map of project location, notice of intent to adopt a notice of exemption for the reclaimed water discharge pipeline. Any questions from staff? There's open for a motion. Mayor Cox, I'm sorry, was the public hearing opened on this item? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was a public hearing. I missed that. It is a public hearing. My apologies. I'm going to first open the public hearing on this matter. For anyone who'd wish to come to speak to the council in regard to this. Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. Any questions, staff, from council members? Any comments? Seeing none, there is a motion. There is a motion and second. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem McEachern, second by Council Member Vias. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. Mr. Mayor, on agenda item B4, I'll be abstaining as I have clients that have applied for these uh, CDBG grants and or are being awarded them. We have an individual who has declared a conflict. We still have a quorum. Court, I open that item. We have, I have one card on B4. One card. All right. Mr. Metzler, this item is a also a public hearing on the Housing Community Development Annual Action Plan before I open the public hearing. Uh, brief explanation in regard to this item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and members of the council. This item is an item uh, that we similarly uh, do each year as an entitlement city uh, to the uh, U.S. Housing and Urban Development Program, uh, which is uh, commonly referred to as HUD. And as an entitlement city, we're uh, allowed to administer in this case of the fiscal year $1.376 million uh, to serve local public service uh, projects uh, that benefit um, uh, low and moderate uh, income type households. Uh, with that, we go through an application process every year. Uh, in that application process, we review applications to make sure that the applications are eligible and consistent with our overall plans that were required uh, to amend. Uh, resulting from having appointed a committee represented by two council persons um, and staff uh, 
the applications have been reviewed, ranked, and recommendations have been brought forward in the staff report, which is outlined uh, in the chart uh, in front of you. Uh, so with that, those represent these uh, recommendations of the committee as to funding for the 14-15 fiscal year. Um, and with that, uh, this item is an item that uh, is asking that you take public testimony and it's staff's recommendation that uh, uh, you adopt resulting from the public testimony the annual action plan, which then uh, memorializes and formalizes uh, the actual recommendations for funding to the subrecipients that have applied for the funds. Are there any questions of our staff members? Comments by council members? If not, I'm going to open the public hearing. If I've read these cards correctly, I only have one card that's uh, been requested to speak on this item. However, anyone that has an interest on this item may come forward and address the council. The public hearing is now open. Hi. Hello. Good evening. My name's Lorraine. I, of course, I'm a case manager at a Better Way Domestic Violence, a Violence Agency. Um, with the city of Victorville, we have numerous ser services we provide here. We provided um, 219 victims of domestic violence with 3,197 shelter nights last year, and that's for Victorville residents. Um, we provide several programs that are open to the public. They don't have to be just domestic violence victims, but they also can be victims in need with CFS cases or somebody who's a parent who needs help. Um, we have an outreach program that consists of three different classes. One is an anger, parenting manage anger management and parenting class. Um, we also have a peer support group that's open to the public, and we also have a victim impact class that teaches about domestic violence. And um, we've provided 26 adults and 44 children with 20,805 nights of transitional housing in Victorville. Our transitional housing program is in Victorville itself. Um, we provided 14, five, 14,560 hours of child care to over 100 children from Victorville. This is all based on last year's figures. We provided 1,431 residents of Victorville different classes, including the classes I spoke about, anger management, victim impact, health and nutrition, basic budgeting, peer support, and, case ma and also case management. Um, we also have had 1,312 hotline calls that were made from Victorville residents this year. We also work in conjunction with the CalWORKs offices, all three of them in the high desert. Um, we go to the Victorville office every Monday. We're available for clients who are um, either aren't able to come to our office or the, the um, welfare office is the only safe way to come and speak to us. So we go to Victorville, we go to Hesperia and, Adel and Adelanto so that we're there on site. We also provide classes to all um, of the Victorville, um, I just lost my place, I'm sorry, Hesperia and Adelanto um, offices. We provide um, um, anti-domestic violence classes as needed by all the um, different area offices. We also have, um, um, a partnership with the county um, for Department of Children and Family Services, um, working in team, de team decision meetings and also working with them. Um, we have a, a facilitator who is there in-house in Victorville um, 20 hours a week. So we cover not only the CFS offices but also the CalWORKs offices. Um, we also just want to make you aware that um, we know it's tough times now and we appreciate any help that um, we are given because everything we get goes back to our clients. And our Victorville clients, of course, we're from Victorville is our city. So those are very important clients to us. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to address the council? This is a public hearing on the 2014-15 Housing and Community Development Annual Action Plan. I do not have any other cards. There's no one else to us to speak to the council. I'm going to close the public hearing if there's no objections. No objections heard. This public hearing is closed. The, rec the committee's recommendation 
which uh, two members of our council sat on that with the staff and they hold uh, meetings prior to this public hearing is to approve and adopt the plan as presented for submittal to the Department of Housing and Urban Development and authorize city manager to execute all necessary documents for submittal to HUD. Motion. Motion by Council Member Viaz, second by Council Member Garcia. Motion carries with Mayor Pro Tem McEachran and Council Member Kennedy absent. Mr. Chairman, if I might, I just wanted to give a formal thank you uh, to Council Members Viaz and Garcia for participating on the committee. It went very smooth and they're very generous with their time to actually go through all of the applications. Thank you, thank you for that reminder and the whole council, thank the two council members who spent quite a bit of time on this. As busy as they are, we still have to provide these, these functions sometimes and it's uh, great when a couple of members of the council step up and take their personal time to have additional functions. So thank you, it doesn't go unnoticed. The next item is the consent calendar, C1 through C7, is that correct Madam Clerk? That's correct. Are there any questions or comments? If not, I have a motion that would cover all of those. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem McEachran, second by Council Member Garcia. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. Next item uh, before the Council uh, would be the written communications on the agenda starting with D1. Yes, D1. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Christian Gunter, Director of Community Services, has a very brief uh, PowerPoint presentation just to kind of bring the council up to speed on where we are with this project uh, and, uh, and where we're headed to with it. Very brief. Well, I'll keep it brief, and I know Sean's presentation later is even briefer, I believe. Council, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, at the 50th anniversary, it was announced that the city of Victorville would like to develop an area of public art. And the area is right outside the building here um, next to the uh, Fallen Officers Memorial. Um, we had, and you'll see from our presentation or the slides that are before you right now, that's the area we're talking about is the uh, a little semicircular area there in the middle of the parking structure. Brandon, next slide, please. That was the picture that was presented at the 50th anniversary celebration. Um, we have been raising funds through private donation for this piece of art. Uh, we're approximately just under $40,000, I believe, at this point. Um, we have been encouraging a number of different groups and artist collaboratives to come forth and submit presentations to us, and we'd like to show you what they look like. I only have a few. Um, Brandon, next slide. This was one submitted by a City of Victorville employee. Specifically, the art was supposed to be a modern art piece. And we looked at this one, this is very nice. Next slide please, Brandon. The next one is a monument, essentially, with four bronze panels submitted by Heritage Bronze out of Hesperia. Next slide please, Brandon. And those are the bronze panels on each, of the, uh, each side of the, the plinth. Um, however, when we got looking at it and thinking about it, we had one submittal by a very nice artist by the name of Joan Swinsky, who is a teacher over at BBC in art. Next slide, please, Brandon. And that's her submittal. When we sat down and wrote the standards for this submittal, <laughs> you ready for the Doug, animals? you ready for the reveal, Doug? Big reveal. <laughs> <laughs> The name of this piece is For the People. Um, when Joan wandered the property, looked around at the area, saw where it was located between essentially the city hall and the courthouse, um, it is a gathering place of people, and particularly of families. Um, the, the family involved and the child in the, the piece of art is something that we think represents Victorville very well, and it is a modern interpretation. So we're asking for your approval for this piece of art. And again, it will go forward as a privately funded through donation piece for the city of Victorville. 
Thank you. The, uh, the tiny version doesn't really do it justice. Um, depending on um, as the costs come in, uh, this piece could actually end up being taller than City Hall. Uh, the goal was to uh, try to create uh, a, a bit of a focal point, something that's a modern interpretive piece of art that people would enjoy. That uh, in theory, at least, if you had visitors uh, from out of state or uh, family visiting, you could bring them by to take a look at it and uh, just kind of enjoy it, uh, as well as some of the other uh, art that's in and around the Civic Center. Christian, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, make the first comment, I guess. I did um, have this presented to me, the one that was passed out. I did not see the other proposals until just this minute. I'm not sure that that's a delinquency on my part. If so, my apologies, but I didn't see it. I personally would like to have a little time to study those. Other members of the council, comments, please. I agree. I'd like more time. Uh, me also. Okay. At this time, Mr. McEachran. Okay, we're going to uh, look at those proposals. We'll have those submitted to Mr. Doug Robertson if you don't already have them. They'll be distributed to the council. We'll have an opportunity to review those, maybe have questions, and come back, and we will put this back on the agenda as soon as reasonably possible. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time on this question, and thank you for the presentation. Item number two. Um, this is a bid submittal summary. It's a fair contract award for roof restoration on the project for the police department at Armagosa facility and the 8th Street Community Center in the amount of $98,250. Any questions of staff? There are no questions. Chair is open for a motion. Motion by Councilmember Baez, second by Councilmember Garcia. Motion carries with Councilmember Kennedy absent. Item D3, Victorville Water District, Natalano Public Utilities Authority, Emergency Water Supply and Intertie Agreement. Question staff. Uh, before we take an action here, the Intertie Agreement is an action with Atlanto, the same thing with the Upper Valley Ranchos Water District, the same thing with the Pinion Hills Community Services Emergency District for Emergency Water Supply. Um, is there any reason these all three can't be handled as one item? You can handle them as one item as long as it's clear that you are voting on items D3, D4, and D5. I'm sorry? Those, 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 that's the way they're listed? Just want to make sure the motion includes approval of all three. Certainly, you can vote on them together. Okay. Well, they're, they're, they all do the same thing. If there are no questions from from council, and apparently there's not, then I would request that the motion include all three items. Motion by Council Member Viez, second by Council Member Garcia. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. Item six, this is uh, an amendment number one to agreement with the Desert Tortoise Preserve Committee, agreement with the Desert Tortoise Preserve Committee, amendment one, California Department of Fish and Game incidental take permit for the interchange. Uh, for the record, staff, just a brief explanation. Uh, sure, I'll ask uh, Mr. McGlade to come down, um, as well as Mr. Gingler, perhaps. Mr. McGlade has a special presentation uh, following Mr. Gingler's comments. <laughs> Go ahead. Members of the City Council, there was an original agreement that was required uh, because there was an impact area for the interchange. You, there was a lot of land that was cleared, and uh, there was habitat area for the Mojave ground squirrel. And, Part of the uh, mitigation was land had to be set aside at some location. So uh, back before the interchange construction started, we uh, had an agreement with the Desert Tortoise Preserve Committee. They're an organization that can set aside land. Uh, it just so happened that it's out uh, in the Barstow area. Um, as it Also as it happened, after the interchange construction started, there was uh, 
some impact area that was not included in the original permit. Also, in addition to that, there was some land that was overcleared by mistake by Riverside Construction. And as a result, we had to amend the permit with Fish and Game, which required additional land needed to be set aside. And that's what this would accomplish. We would amend the agreement we already have with the Desert Tortoise Reserve Committee, and they, in turn, would set aside some additional land for that impact area. There was some money that was withheld by Sandback for Riverside Construction's construction payment that will partially offset the additional cost to us. Unfortunately, it doesn't fully offset that cost. But this is a requirement by Fish and Game to fulfill the permit for the habitat that was taken for the interchange project. And this is additional habitat for what, tortoise or? It's actually for the Mojave ground squirrel. Mojave ground squirrel. It's that habitat. Were there any Mojave ground squirrels found on this site? No. So they're not relocating anything. They're just buying additional land so they can expand wherever they're at. Yeah. It was assumed, I guess, one of the options in the permit is instead of trying to trap them and locate them, you just assume its habitat area, assume presence. And they gave us actually a pretty good ratio for setting aside the land. So we thought that would be the best option. And the land that we're setting aside or requiring to be set aside is located where? It's actually in the Harper Lake area. If I remember right, I believe it's northeast of Barstow. So once we make the payment, we have no further obligation. This organization maintains the land. We don't need to do anything else. Any questions? So do we have no choice in this matter? Essentially, you have no choice in this matter, yes. Is that true? That is true. I mean, you could get into a prolonged fight, but the uh, the exactions by Fish and Game have been upheld in courts, so it's probably a losing battle. Okay, if you were extorted by a private individual like this, they'd go to jail, but since this is a wing of the federal government that's in the state, there's nothing we can do about it except make sure we raise more money from taxpayers to set aside an area where they probably don't exist to begin with. And you can't locate them there because studies have indicated that there are germs and diseases that are indigenous to animals in a certain location. And if you put them in another location with the same animals, they probably all die off. So this is well thought out. We'll, we'll pay the, the money and we'll buy the land and get on with our business because we have no choice. Yes. That's and Mr. True. Mayor, following our, uh, our agenda briefing yesterday, I did speak with uh, Mr. McGlade, and he has a photo of a Mojave ground squirrel, the, the mythical Mojave ground squirrel that so many think actually don't exist. Uh, so I've asked him to show that to the council, um, as well as the actual location uh, indicated by the biologist as to where it was found, if you would like to see that. I don't want to hear from the biologist, but go ahead with the picture. <laughs> Sean's not even going to give up. get up. So this uh, actually happened as part of uh, some work being done at SCLA. Uh, there was a biologist uh, who came out and did some trapping, and that he verified that that actually is a Mojave ground squirrel. And then his little GPS device there gives us the precise location as to where that Mojave ground squirrel was found. Uh, and Brandon, if you can go to one more slide. There you go. That's where it was. Uh, yeah. Just sure. essentially just north of SCLA. Show that ground squirrel again, please. Oh, back it up. Notice the size of the hand. Notice the size of the ground squirrel. It is not a large animal. Sure not. It's taken many, many years to find one, so I hope they're all satisfied now. I'm just out of curiosity. Why, why do we need those? Um, it, it's interesting. I, uh, I had a meeting. I didn't realize we were going to get this deep into this. It was, it was more a little touch of humor, as Mr. Cox loves to talk about the fact that they don't exist. Um, but... Uh, I don't think they do. What happens if you have a project, uh, and I confirmed this with Fish and Game because I wanted to know what it meant when, they, when you have to file and pay for what's called a take permit. Um, and this was back, I don't know, not quite 10 years ago that I spoke with, uh, with the regional director for Fish and Game. 
and ask what happens after they've trapped a Mojave ground squirrel if there's a project coming. Uh, do they then take it and relocate it to the land that we're forced to buy at 5 to 1 or 6 to 1 or however many to 1 it is? I think we got it at 4 something to 1 in this case. Um, and his response was, well, no, you don't actually move the animal. You put it back in the ground. Um, and I said, well, what happens when you know the bulldozer comes along? He says, well, that's the essence of a take permit. The animals are not moved. They, they basically are killed when the bulldozers come along. So uh, the biologist gets paid to go out and trap them, verify that they're there. You pay a lot of money, and you can essentially then um, exterminate. I don't know what else to call it. Uh, but the animals go away. No attempt to save the animal after you pay all that money. No, no, no there is no attempt to save the animal. Okay. Well, <laughs> there's a recommendation of the staff. Number one, approve the attached amendment to the agreement with the Desert Tortoise Preserve Committee, Inc., and two, authorize staff to pay $87,005.68. Apparently can't get a second. Oh, we did. Motion by Council Member Garcia, second by Mayor Pro Tem McEachern. Motion carries with Councilmember Kennedy absent and Councilmember Vias voting no. Well, I wanted to. And just so you know, the squirrel that was in that photo is, as far as we know, if he's still alive, he's, there was nothing ever developed on that parcel. At least not yet. Item number eight, presentation of request to approve award of the piggyback purchase of a ditch witch, FX 50-800 vacuum Excavation machine with hydraulic boom. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I got so excited about saving the Mojave ground squirrel that I skipped an item. Sorry. Seven, award construction contract to Sully Miller in the amount of $492,000 for the Hesperia Road overlay from Bear Valley Road to Nisqually Road. No question of staff. Chairs up for motion. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem McEachern, second by Councilmember Garcia. Thank you. And now item eight. Excuse me, Councilmember Garcia, may I get a vote I'm from sorry. you? Motion carries with Councilmember Kennedy absent. Just for your information and watching this, sometimes when I proceed and they haven't had the vote, I can't see the votes of the council. And they can't see each other's votes. So, for clarification, uh, presentation of a request to approve award of the, pig, uh, of the piggyback purchase of a ditch witch FX 50-800 vacuum excavation machine with hydraulic broom, boom and cyclone separator in the amount of $76,394.19. We have a motion and a second. Motion by Mayor Pro Tem McEachern, second by Council Member Baez. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. Agenda item nine, amendment number three to the General Services Provider Standard Agreement by and between successor agency to the Victorville Redevelopment Agency and Wilson and Company Inc. for Foxborough Railroad Inspection, Maintenance and Repair Services. Uh, just very briefly, Keith, since I had a question, since the redevelopment agency doesn't exist, how do we still do business with the redevelopment agency? Just a brief explanation, please. Yes, Mr. Mayor and members of the council, this item is actually being undertaken in your role as the successor agency to the Victorville Redevelopment Agency. So these uh, improvements uh, to the rail track that was actually built by the RDA out in the Foxborough Industrial Park are being funded through the uh, ROPS process, which is the enforceable obligation pro, uh, process for the state of California. So effectively, uh, when the state dissolved redevelopment, provisions were made to at least respect the contractual obligations of the former RDA. So this is identified on the, the ROPS um, for standard maintenance and upkeep of uh, that rail system. So. Uh, under that guise, this item is presented uh, for your consideration to address the emergency repair needs uh, for that rail system. Thank you, Keith. And just, just for understanding, same as roads or any other capital improvement that's been constructed, it must be maintained, even though the overall 
umbrella redevelopment agency no longer exist. It's still there, must be maintained for businesses and individuals can still use it. Motion, please. Motion by Council Member Vias, second by Council Member Garcia. Motion carries with Council Member Kennedy absent. The next item, I'm assuming, Mr. Attorney, I have to declare a conflict. That is correct, because of your uh, residence on the golf course. Uh, next I know that I, I'm just going to make the statement that a lot of individuals expect me to be a part of this. I, please explain after I leave the room why I can't be. I don't want to be. Agenda item uh, D10, this is a request. The City Council approve the appropriation of new batteries for leased golf cart fleet in amount not to exceed 62000 Mr. City Attorney, as the mayor had requested, can you explain why he cannot per, uh, partake or participate? Pay? Yes, he, uh, he owns a residence that is located on the golf course and in accordance with FPPC rules, the Fair Political Practices Commission, uh, that would be deemed to be a conflict of interest uh, because of the potential income he may receive one way or the other from benefits uh, deemed to, to attribute, be attributable to the golf course. Okay. And a brief presentation by staff on this item. Christian Gunter is going to come down and give the presentation. Good evening, Mar Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Um, Essentially, the city's golf cart fleet at Green Tree Golf Clubhouse has uh, batteries that have failed. Um, unfortunately, this was not a budgeted item. Uh, it is something that needs to be addressed right away. The carts currently aren't making it around the course to uh, finish play for uh, those people who are out at the course playing. So we're asking for some an additional funding through the um, uh, general fund balance to help pay for this. Any questions from council members? I mean, it's just sucking the life out of us, but you know, we're in it knee deep, so what do you do? Christian, um, it's amazing the rumors that come out of that facility. Um, I don't know who's spreading them, but uh, I did hear something of these batteries making their way to some sort of store in Apple Valley and being sold out there. I just like to get a report because I noticed in the agenda item that we get credit for turning in the old batteries. Um, that is correct. And purchasing the new ones. I just want to make sure that all the old batteries are going and we're getting the new ones and that they're all accounted for. Because I don't know why I hear such things like uh, these old batteries are being removed from the existing golf carts and sold to some store in Apple Valley. But uh, that is what I've heard. So. I'd like to make sure that we get some sort of report that indicates that that's not the case. Not that I'm, I, I have no knowledge of that. Um, I'd be glad to go out and do an inventory tomorrow for that matter. It's first well, I just think it. as part of getting the new batteries, obviously we're going to be turning in the old ones. So yes, we probably as a recycling proof value. Crack that one. Okay. How often do we have to replace the batteries? Life on the batteries may run three to four years. Um, we're right on the edge of that right now. Uh, in terms of the batteries that are failing right now are the same ones that came with the carts that are about three years old at this point. So. It has been an ongoing um, thing that we have to purchase batteries then? Yes. Whenever we've owned carts in the past, we've always planned ahead for buying batteries. Um, sometimes we will budget half of it in one year, half in another year, and hopefully the batteries fail right on the cusp there. All right, if there's no further questions, I'll entertain a motion. Motion by Council Member Vias, second by Council Member Garcia. Motion carries with Mayor Cox and Council Member Kennedy absent. Agenda item number 11, this is discussion and possible action regarding the Green Tree Golf Course, a notice of default and potential action to consider an additional appropriations request. Uh, Mr. Metzler. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council. Uh, this item has been brought to your attention resulting from uh, recent action undertaken by the city with respect to the management contract for the Green Tree Golf Course. And uh, last month, uh, this was a matter that was discussed in closed session. And uh, resulting from that, uh, we did issue a notice of default relating to the management services provided by Billy Casper Golf, and, and particularly that default notice included uh, two particular provisions citing physical conditions and financial conditions. Um, and just as background, this council is aware that we've uh, had a contract with Billy Casper Golf since uh, July 1st of 2010, and that contract runs through June 30 of 2015. The contract does include provisions that allows for mutual exercise of two five-year options. Uh, so we're nearing uh, the last year of the final initial uh, term of the contract. Um, since the time of the notice, uh, I'm pleased to report that as it relates to the physical conditions or the physical condition of default, um, I've uh, verified the con conditions of play uh, a couple times in the last couple weeks and have verified that, that the conditions of the course have improved substantially, uh, substantially so uh, that I believe it certainly will assist in enhancing the ability to attract uh, additional golf uh, activity to the golf course. Uh, with that, we still have the financial issue uh, to, to overcome. And the financial issue, I think, largely can be summarized based upon the fact that we annually, as a part of our uh, ongoing budget, do budget uh, a subsidy for the golf course. And this year, we budgeted uh, approximately $369,000, which uh, uh, many of us believe that was a very ambitious number, uh, a number that uh, wasn't achieved. And accordingly, um, we're at a position today where uh, there are uh, payables due to the order of about $306,000 and still a projected uh, shortfall for the remainder of the fiscal year. Altogether, it's believed that an additional $332,341 is needed uh, to help complete the fiscal year. Um, with that, uh, we do have uh, Regional Vice President Bill Rahanick uh, representing uh, Billy Casper Golf that it's here to give a, a presentation, but I think largely also a presentation that's designed to um, share with us what they've learned and how they're retooling the business model to try to achieve some kind of uh, measurable success going uh, forward. And then with that concluding from the presentation, I certainly have options uh, for you to consider. Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, staff, thank you very much for allowing us to be here this evening. I'm Bill Rahanick. I'm Senior Vice President of Billy Casper Golf. I have responsibility for all of our courses from Chicago West. I reside in Chicago. I have with me this evening Chris Jones, Regional Manager, resides locally. I'm sure you're all familiar with Chris. Uh, we also have uh, our Regional Director of Marketing, Aaron Marshall. Uh, you may probably have not met him before. Aaron also resides locally. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Jimmy Hall, our General Manager at Green Tree. I'm sure you've all met Jimmy on many occasions. Next slide, please. For those of you not familiar with Billy Casper Golf, just very briefly, we are the largest domestic operator of golf courses with more than 150 in the continental United States and Hawaii. More than half of those are municipally owned, so we manage more than 80 municipal golf courses in 27 states. Next slide, please. A regional team dedicated to the operation of Green Tree, in addition to the operations and marketing bodies represented here tonight, include agronomy oversight, human resources, IT, insurance, safety, administration, and countless others who support Green Tree Golf Course. Next slide. Before we get into a discussion of where we are today and how we got there, I thought it was appropriate to just touch briefly on where we came from. When we were hired in April of 2010, Green Tree Golf Course was losing approximately $850,000 a year, was experiencing a decline in rounds and revenue that was reflective of a marketing that market that was already showing weakness. There were what I call struggling course conditions. Uh, had a F and B tenant who was paying a modest lease payment for the operation of the restaurant, and there were additional city overhead dollars allocated to the management of golf. Next slide, please. Where we are today, that operating loss has been reduced in fiscal year 2014, our uh, worst year to date, by still by over $200,000 a market that continues to decline. It is very reflective of what's going on in golf in general. Uh, rounds are down nationwide. In secondary and seasonal markets, it's even worse. 
and Victorville falls into both of those categories. Despite all these challenges, we do have improved course conditions. We are now generating over $100,000 a year in profit from F&B operations, and there's no additional city overhead specifically allocated to the oversight of golf. Next slide, please. This slide represents the rounds of golf played at Green Tree going back to fiscal year 2008. You can see that uh, the first four years of Billy Casper Golf Operations saw an increase in those rounds. We did see a decline in fiscal year 2014. I'll speak to that briefly in just a moment. And we are forecasting an increase in fiscal year 2015, uh, reflective of new strategies and uh, to Mr. Metzler's uh, point, some things that we've learned. Uh, we're very confident that that strategy will be effective. Uh, next slide, please. This slide represents revenues from the golf course since fiscal year 2008. And you can see that that follows the trend in rounds played very closely. Uh, our strategies in fiscal year 2015 will drive revenue as a result primarily of driving rounds and increasing food and beverage revenues. Next slide. And this is our average per round, the dollars collected per participant in golf at the golf course, also dating back to fiscal year 2008. You can see there has not been a tremendous amount of movement upward or downward in that. One of our strategies in the fiscal year 2014 was to leverage what we felt were vastly improved golf course conditions, a far superior customer experience at Green Tree, owing largely to the very, very nice clubhouse that we have. And we figured with the uh, significant improvement we had in the product that our constituents would be willing to pay just a dollar or two more per round. That strategy has not proven effective. Our strategies in fiscal year 15, as you can see on the slide, reflect a slight decline in the average per round we expect to collect. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this slide very simply represents the loss that was in place at the golf course in uh, fiscal year 10 when we started. Uh, fiscal year 14, the blue column is uh, this year, that's our worst year, and fiscal year 15 shows a reduction in that operating loss of approximately $125,000. It would be commensurate with the loss that we experienced last year. This is a very basic competitive analysis. It's intended to reflect where Green Tree stacks up in the market. You can see that Spring Valley uh, is the highest charging uh, public access golf course in the market. Spring Valley is not primarily uh, incumbent upon public rounds for its revenue. Uh, so when we take them out of the mix, Green Tree uh, is the uh, top of the heap. Uh, aptly so. We feel like we have the best golf course and the best overall experience. Uh, but it's also reflective of the fact that we have a very, very modest price structure in place at Green Tree, and we are still the most expensive golf course for public access in the market. Next slide, please. Golf course conditions, top right, you can see what was here in 2010, April, and just this week, April 2014, same golf hole, same location. I think the contrast speaks for itself. The next slide, uh, top right, April 2010, bottom left, April 2014, uh, same location. You can see dramatic improvement in the course conditions there. The next slide, April 2010, top left, April 2014, bottom right, same hole, same location. And lastly, uh, April 2010, top right. April 2014, bottom left, sands the golfer. Uh, you get a pretty good indication that the turf quality is much better. Attention to detail is much tighter. It's the result of sound agronomic practice, cultural practice, and uh, Jimmy's very hard work. Next slide, please. So what are our customers saying? Well, the uh, readers of the Daily Press just last month voted Green Tree Golf Course the best of the desert. I think that says a lot. Uh, next slide, please. But not everything they have to say is great. Uh, what we've heard from them uh, very recently specifically is fix the golf carts. Uh, it's not a walking climate, and it's not a walking constituency. They want golf carts to ride in, and we've been struggling to provide those. We've been down as low as 40 functional golf carts because of the battery issue. They have noticed it has cost us rounds in revenue. They've told us in no uncertain terms that price is very important. It's a very price-sensitive market. With fewer rounds being played in the market, our competitors are charging less and less and getting more aggressive. They expect Green Tree to respond. They want us to continue to improve the golf course. Despite the fact that it's better, they always want it to be even better the next day. So they expect continuous improvement in the golf course product. They want more beverage cart service, which I agree with. When I play golf, I like to see a beverage cart coming around. Uh, we've heard them loud and clear. They love the staff interactions that they experience at Green Tree, and they want us to maintain that. Next slide, please. So what happened this year if everything is so good at Green Tree? 
well, there was continued downward pressure in the market. Fewer rounds played, golf courses competing for those rounds very aggressively, uh, price compression, prices are dropping. We had a well failure. We were actually pumping some sand back in August of last summer. We were, th were largely without water for the golf course in August and September, two of the warmest months of the year, and that did impact course conditions through the fall and into the early winter. Golf carts have been mentioned. You've uh, graciously agreed to remedy that situation here tonight. In spite of all this, the quality standards of the golf course were maintained, the service standards of the facility were maintained, and we recognize now that our strategy to improve yield through pricing did not work. Despite the quality and the experience at Green Tree, customers simply are not willing to pay a dollar or two more. They expect us to be price competitive in this market. Our win will be based upon earning more rounds of golf and not necessarily just more dollars per the rounds that we have. Next slide, please. So that begs the question, what will be different in fiscal year 2015? Well, obviously a new marketing approach. We have to be responsive to what our customers are telling us. They don't want to pay more for golf. We have to be price competitive. That will drive our marketing plan in 2015. Jimmy will tell you that he's never been more optimistic about the team that he has in place than he is right now going into the new fiscal year. We've gone through some staff changes. Jimmy feels like he's got absolute buy-in and the right team to go make hay in 2015. We have new marketing tools. We could present to this council uh, for hours and hours the things that are changing in Billy Casper Golf's marketing platform. We were already best in industry. We've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in that platform this year. Uh, I'll bring Aaron Marshall up in just a moment to talk very briefly about how we will approach marketing differently in 2015 and beyond. But it's very exciting, very 21st century stuff. We have new this year increased food and beverage support and focus. We've hired one of the finest talents in the food and beverage industry as our vice president of food and beverage. He's there to help us make our food and beverage operation better, uh, more popular, and more profitable. Uh, we have resolved the water and golf cart issues at this point, and we intend to continue to widen the gap between Green Tree and our competitors in terms of service and overall facility quality. Our rounds and revenue strategy this year is to get us back to 43,000 rounds. That's where we were just a couple of years ago. Uh, we want to revamp a lot of our core marketing programs, loyalty programs, third-party distribution. For those of you who don't know, third-party means somebody else sells your tee times, much like Orbitz or Expedia when you travel. Uh, we have uh, national agreements with those third-party distributors that are very favorable to Green Tree. Make use of frequent specials to fill off-use times and improved membership pricing. That'll drive $115,000 in additional golf revenue from 9,000 new rounds next year. It is quite simply a volume strategy. Next slide. Food and beverage, we are projecting $150,000 in food and beverage improvement. I've already mentioned our new focus in food and beverage. We are gonna hire a dedicated salesperson for Green Tree to help drive banquet and event revenue. We have expanded hours of operation. We will add fine dining hours and the aforementioned beverage cart service will be expanded. And lastly, retail. Uh, we're going to show $30,000 in retail improvement. This is primarily the result of an increased retail presence. We've been very skinny in retail, not wanting to stock the shelves too heavily. Uh, inventory is dollars on the shelf. We have national account pricing in place that we think will help us drive margin and profit in the retail outlet. We will stock consistent quality. We'll sell according to Golf Day to tech what's hot, and we are not going to get green trees stuck in a lot of very expensive drivers that are almost obsolete the day that you put them on the shelf. We're going to be very judicious about how we stock the shelves. Next slide. Our new marketing approach, we've always felt that we've been very good on the friendly and the quality. And we are uh, very dedicated to providing the enjoyable golf experience. Uh, the quality at Green Tree speaks for itself. We have to reemphasize in 2015 and beyond the affordable, recognizing the market that we're in, the demographics, and the price sensitivity. Affordability takes place with friendly and quality in 2015. Quarter Our Culture will continue to be our ACE program, ACE the customer experience. We train all of our teams to be extremely guest sensitive, to provide the enjoyable guest experience. We don't leave it to chance. We secret shop all of our facilities. Green Tree has been one of our top performers in the ACE Mystery Shop program since day one under Jimmy's leadership. ACE and the guest experience that we provide at Green Tree will continue to be front and center uh, of the experience. I'd like to bring Aaron Marshall up uh, real quickly.
to talk about marketing. You know, we're going to do things that are creative and, and programming based beyond just the things that we already know about. World's largest golf outing, whether you've heard of it or you haven't, uh, that benefits the Wounded Warrior Project. Last year, including Green Tree, we golfed over 7,000 golfers and raised, I'm sorry, 11,000 golfers and raised $700,000 for the Wounded Warrior Project. Green Tree was a, was a very uh, happy participant in that event. Women continue to be the latent demand in golf. Women on course is our attempt to bring women to the game. Participation of women in the game since 30 years ago has not markedly changed. Uh, women have disposable income, and they are ready to golf now. Uh, marketing golf to women requires a special twist. We have incorporated women on course as part of our strategy to bring women to the game. Uh, there are non-traditional outlets for golf. You see up the screen represented foot golf. There are others. Uh, we are experimenting with all of these non-traditional approaches to golf. We've always been growing the game through junior golf. The challenge with junior golf is what you do today bears fruit 10, 15 years from now, and we need revenue now. And I already mentioned our relationship with third-party distributors and how uh, by our volume and size we can leverage those relationships to benefit Green Tree and our other clients. Now I'm going to introduce Aaron Marshall to speak briefly about Billy Casper Golf's marketing platform, and then I'll bring it back for question and answer. Oh. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. So as Bill mentioned that, you know, we, ha we have done a lot this year redoing our, basically blowing up our marketing and just starting from the ground up and, you know, new tools, spending lots and lots of money on it. So on this slide here, you can see the big focus there is data. Green Tree has always been and actually in Billy Casper Golf has always been our culture to collect data. Uh, big data is all you hear about today with large companies, large retailers. So we're starting to think more of retailers and we brought a lot of people in house from outside the company that worked highly in the retail environment and with AT&T. So this is our whole ecosystem and basically the data there is really drives all of those and we're really drilling down into player habits, you know, when people are playing, how much they're paying, and you know, we can really start targeting and segmenting, and that's where we can really grow revenue. So you can go ahead and next slide. Another part of our revamping of our marketing is our digital platform. These are our new websites that are currently being rolled out. Uh, we redesigned them, and these are best in the market. You can't find these with any other management company, golf company. It's uh, designed to be really engaging, really visual, uh, to draw you in. We created the Billy Casper Digital Network. We've uh, hired a an editor who's worked for Golf Channels, worked for Golf.com, uh, really well known throughout the industry, uh, highly respected. He's going to be writing articles, local articles, so if Jimmy wanted to be able to feature uh, high school golf or something special that he's doing at Green Tree, we can actually feature it on our Billy Casper Digital Network, which will hit 160 websites throughout the entire country. So I believe right now we currently we hit around 500 unique page views per month uh, across the country. So the websites are there to keep you coming back, not just to book a tea time, but to also come back, read news, and uh, just stay engaged. It also has social media built into it. so. You know, we get more social postings. Jimmy can post uh, blogs, course updates, things like that. Really designed to be really engaging. And go to the next slide, please. And so this is also part of our new tools. Um, just kind of show you just a quick snapshot. Uh, looks like a lot of pretty colors, but it actually gives me a lot of data and feedback of when player segments are playing, um, if a member's playing at this time, how many rounds they're playing, what they're paying, um, you know, all of that, and it's you know, it tells me a lot. I can see when we have low utilization, and that in turn, with all of our data that we're collecting, I can then go start targeting and segmenting and growing revenue for the golf course. Let me go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm gonna pass it back over to Bill. When we talk about Green Tree, we can't just talk about golf. The clubhouse was constructed to be a focal point in the community. It's got. Uh, high quality food and beverage outlets, banquet facility, bar and restaurant. Uh, our intent in 2015 is to continue to emphasize those outlets and that experience to drive revenue and profitability there. While golf may be a uh, revenue outlet that is challenged, people continue to eat, food and beverage continues to be a growth opportunity. I think this community alone has seen uh, a lot of new restaurants coming up 
uh, up and down the strip. Uh, food and beverage continues to be a great opportunity. Uh, our vice president of food and beverage, Frank Denniston, uh, boils it down quite simply. You've got quality, price value uh, equals profits. Uh, we have a great opportunity at Green Tree to produce just that quality, value, and profits. So uh, next slide, please. Our results are going to be premised on being better. That's a better product, better people, and better pricing. Uh, we had success in 2013. Our attempts to leverage the quality of Green Tree into added revenue per round resulted in some decline. We've had other challenges. I mentioned the well, the battery issues, very real challenges to driving revenue. Uh, going into 2015, we're very confident that we can drive the top line where we said we can. Uh, we are not looking to make excuses or economize or sacrifice the product. We will continue to ratchet Green Tree up over the long haul. It begins with a revamped marketing approach, and uh, Aaron can get very specific with some of the things that we've done in the past that we're confident will work in the future. Uh, but at this point, I'd just like to open it up to questions and answers for you. Questions from members of the council? I don't know if it's so much a question. Um, you came before this council numerous times asking for more and more money, and each time we warned you not to come back, to follow the contract, to stay within the budget. Every time you came up with excuses, and now you come with four empty suits, asking for more money, asking for more time, and you just now figured it out after how many hundreds of thousands of dollars in the hole that you've drugged this golf course in? You show us some nice pictures of some green grass. You finally taught your staff to turn on the water, figure out the pump's not working. I told you last time you had incompetent management. And now you're coming back and trying to tell us that, you know, feed us all this BS that it's all fixed now. I'd make a motion to terminate contract tonight. Um, regarding the condition of the golf course, I had the opportunity to get out there and play on Saturday. Um, quite frankly, as a member of the city council, and I know there's other members uh, that can't participate in these discussions, um, over the last couple of years, we've kind of steered clear of the facility because every time we're over there, all we do is get complaints. Um, just as recently as October of last year when the Victorville Chamber of Commerce had their tournament there, um, the conditions of the course were far from uh, what they were on Saturday. Um, my compliments to you on whatever has been done uh, since that time because the condition of play was uh, really excellent on Saturday. There were things that I could point to, but nothing that wasn't manageable. Um, I, I do have to caution you on being the best of the desert because in that um, contest that the daily press holds, they choose three out of the high desert, and there's only four playable courses up here, maybe five. Um, so I, I don't know that that necessarily states anything. Um, something else that I had heard I have not seen, but I've been told that we have a lot of um, players coming from out of the area and that uh, there are some specific groups that come up and have foursomes and they want their own individual cart. At any time, is your organization allowing foursomes to go out, each player having their own individual carts? We don't typically sanction that unless there's a special need. I would have to defer to Jimmy. Jimmy, has that occurred? No. Okay. Um, with respect to the, the water systems, uh, you've obviously made uh, some statements here tonight that are very concerning to me. <clears throat> if memory serves me correctly, and I'll defer to our staff, I believe we spent quite a lot of money in recent years putting in new water systems, automatic watering systems, uh, and the like, and I don't know the specifics of that. Um, but again, I'm hearing rumors of uh, your staff having to manually turn on water to water the course, which makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, 
could staff address what they've indicated with respect to the water situation? The water system was an issue um, uh, late last year, an issue that we've worked with uh, the management team to, to my understanding, resolve. And, and it's my understanding that having resolved the water system issue late last year has largely been what's contributed to helping uh, um, get the course in the condition that it is in today. But is the water system now automatic or? It, it, it's a very automated uh, water system. Uh, there's there's a control system that allows them to, to measure. Um, I can't speak to it in great detail, but it's a fairly sophisticated watering system as I know it to be. Um, there was some questions and issues with respect to uh, the well system that we had installed that actually had been in place for maybe 10 years and started running into uh, uh, life expectancy issues where we did make some changes to uh, the source of water uh, over the last several months. And I, I know that's what's contributed to uh, those water issues. Uh, if there's any new water issues uh, today, I'm not aware of them. Okay. You know, the other thing, you, you talked about marketing and, and getting players back to the course. Um, it, you would obviously accomplish something if you could get three members of the city council back out there. Uh, obviously, it took something like this to even get me to go and play, and I used to play there all the time. My, my greater concern when it comes to food and beverage, as well as perhaps tournaments that have been played there, we've seen significant drop off in groups leaving Green Tree uh, that have held their tournaments there for years to go to places like Apple Valley, um, perhaps Spring Valley Lake, maybe in some cases even Asperia uh, to hold their tournaments. And in most cases, they're not complaining to you. They're complaining to me. They're complaining to other members of the council. Um, there might be issues with course, of the, uh, course conditions, which I think you have cured. Um, but how are you going to get them back? I mean, these people left, and their message to me was, as long as you're there, they're not coming back. So I don't know how you're going to get these people back, because um, obviously they left for a reason. and you know, with all due respect, you've shown us a lot of a lot of things here tonight, but I don't understand how it got to this point um, where you had so many people leaving. Uh, you know, whether it be groups that held their tournaments there, or even groups that civic organizations that have their regular meetings there, whether it be weekly or on a monthly basis, um, that have left the facility due to complaints regarding food and beverage or due to complaints regarding the condition of the course, I mean, I can't be your salesperson and go back out there and get them there. Because if I'm going to be doing that, then I think our own staff should be running the course, not you. So how are you going to get them back? Well, thankfully, we know who they are and we can reach out to them. The numbers bear out that actually event rounds and revenue have been fairly stable. There has been some turnover there. We have intent this year to hire a full-time dedicated salesperson, which clearly will help. Uh, Jimmy does a lot of that work now. Uh, we will delegate that to a salesperson who will have the time and resources to reach out. We're a very sa sales-oriented culture. Customers are customers, whether they're group customers or individual customers. Sometimes they leave for material reasons, and sometimes it's price. What we experienced this year was a lot of price attrition, where we did not maintain some of the programs that were very price aggressive. We also raised some prices on some groups. We had in the past pricing in place that was less than what it cost us to put the plate on the table. And when we went to raise some of those prices, we did have customers that chose to leave. Oftentimes, customers are not comfortable citing prices, their reason for making their decision, and I understand why. Uh, the, the good takeaway is that we know who they are. It's easy to re-engage them. And if we've done something wrong, that's service recovery. That's a mea culpa. Uh, Disney coined it best. They would rather they get more loyalty out of a customer that had a bad experience that they fixed, then they get out of a customer that never had a bad experience to begin with. We're prepared to lay down our egos, reach out to those customers, find out what went wrong, where they were unhappy, and make it right. Okay, um, that's all the questions I have. You did not have any questions or comments? Uh, well, okay, uh, I'm new uh, with the council. I have only been a, a council person for one year. Uh, however, um, since the time before I was elected, I was coming to the meetings, and I have heard nothing but that you're not complying. 
to the contract, and everything that you have shown us tonight is everything that you're planning to do in the future, but nothing that has been accomplished to date. Um, so I'm not too sure that, uh, that I understand, you know, how you can be so sure that you can actually accomplish everything that you have uh, shown us tonight uh, when your track record hasn't been fulfilled. Well, we have, to be honest, we have, re we have engineered a fairly significant financial turnaround at Green Tree Golf Course. You saw what the loss was in the year preceding our arrival. And to date, just from golf operations, we've mitigated, I would estimate, about a million dollars in losses just in the four years that we've been there. Now, that has not been in, in uh, concert with the budgeted numbers that we faced every year. There has been significant uh, desire amongst all involved to see the subsidy to the golf course reduced. And we have budgeted aggressively to that end. What we have not done is spent significantly less simply because the revenues did not show up. Until 2014, what we had was a continued pattern of increased rounds and revenue. So we were performing. In 2014, in the face of uh, desire to see that subsidy reduced even further, we looked at the marketing programs and said, look, we've got 43,000 rounds in a distressed market. Can we reasonably expect to grow 43,000 rounds where there used to be 30,000 and be successful finding those rounds, or should we begin now to leverage the improvement in the quality of the golf course and the overall experience to try and charge just marginally more? And that was the strategy in 2014. That strategy was partially undermined by the challenges I mentioned earlier with the well system. To be clear, it's not the watering system. It is the well system. The source of water dried up, so we ran out of water. The system from a dry well started to pump sand, which was clogging the heads and creating all kinds of maintenance problems for the irrigation system. So we had that challenge, and obviously the golf cars since about November of this year have been an impediment to revenue. Uh, but that strategy, whether those challenges were there or they weren't, probably was not going to be effective in hindsight. It was our best business bet to grow revenue in 2014. So what we're telling you we're going to do in 2015 is go back to where we were in 2013, being very price aggressive, very competitive in this market. We feel we are a better experience, a better golf course. We know that if we're competitive with, with price in what is an ultra-competitive market, that we can be successful. To the extent that it involves groups and events, we'll just reach back out to those folks and find out what they're not happy about. Uh, it's been my experience over a very long and arduous golf career that when you screw up a relationship, it's incumbent upon you to reach out and fix it. And when you do that, you get a good result. So I, I don't know who the, specifically those groups are, uh, but I'm sure Jimmy can, does or can find out, and that's our strategy there. So we, it's a great question, and I thank you for asking it. We have been successful at Green Tree. What we haven't done, we haven't achieved the revenue that we've budget, budgeted in every year. We've largely complied with the operating budgets of the club. We haven't overspent. We haven't gone out and wasted money. We've spent what had to be spent to maintain the quality uh, image of the facility. It has not resulted in the revenue generation that we would have liked to have seen. It has resulted in revenue growth historically. On average, our revenues have far outperformed what was there before we got there. We just fell short this year, and it's our plan in 2015 to revise that. Uh, it's a very realistic goal, and we're confident we can do it. I, I guess I, I, I don't understand. We're charging $19 a game. Everyone else is charging $10 a game. You can't make it on 19 a game, and you expect to become affordable. The numbers aren't going to work. I can't speak to the practicality of, of owning a golf course in this market. The prospects of being profitable in this market, I would say, are not high. Uh, golf is a very challenging industry to, to start with, and this is a very challenging market. What we're talking about here is minimizing the subsidy that the city has to the golf course, if that's the city's desire. And the strategy that we think minimizes that is to bring as many customers as we can at the prices the market will bear and continue to run a quality operation. Over time, we feel that strategy will result in more and more revenue and more and more market share as our competitors continue to compromise uh, their core product. 
You know, I, I went to, I, I don't play golf, but I went there to have lunch. And um, I sat there, and nobody acknowledged me for about 30 minutes. I waited and waited, and finally somebody came up, took our order. The order came in wrong, and it tasted terrible. And I watched the golfers come in and bring their own beer. Well, we have a bar there. We have a liquor license, correct? So your profits are going out the door because you're allowing them to BYO, bring their own. Uh, I, I couldn't believe how poorly run, and there was absolutely the worst customer service I'd ever seen. Um, and you're offering $19 a game, coming up here telling us you're the best in the desert, and giving us a bunch of promises again. And I, I, I'm not going to believe another word you say. I'm done. I'm done with this, uh, and I'm not going to give another cent. You keep talking about that you, know, you, you helped us a lot, but give us the numbers that you gave us the other night of how much in the hole they are out of all the years that we've had to add subsidies. Um, yeah, I don't have the trend in front of me, but I can talk through the numbers that we're dealing with with today. And um, you know, unfortunately, I, I have to say that getting to this point, uh, issuing the notice of default in any contract is is never fun. The the unfortunate thing for us is we're the owner of a golf course, um, and so we're subjected to whether we run it or a private entity run it runs it. We're subjected to. Uh, the management and, of course, the economy. So uh, I think those do factor in. But as it stands right now, in this current uh, budget year, we did budget 369000 plus or minus um, as uh, subsidy operational short shortfall um, to keep the doors open at Green Tree. Uh, as we stand today, that $369,000 has been expended, and there is uh, – a need for $332,341 to get through the remaining uh, part of the fiscal year. Um, inside that $332,000, though, three hundred six is actually in payables, uh, payables that uh, extend anywhere from one, uh, 90 to 120 days. So there's an amount, just a very substantial amount, that has to be uh, recognized and cured. Um, payables uh, in in that 306 include payables not only to the city of Victorville but certainly management fees uh, that are owed to uh, uh, Billy Casper Golf as both of us has been deferring to try to help keep the operations afloat so we've been both putting some effort uh, in that regard um, so with that that's effectively what we're staring at through the fiscal year uh, the unfortunate side of getting to the point of issuing a notice of default is, you know, at least at this point today, it feels like we've got uh, a management company listening. Um, you know, we've had to deal with the complaints over the years. We've had to deal with the course conditions. And, you know, when I first started looking at this golf course, I was focused on the course conditions because, in my mind, course conditions help drive that golfer loyalty. And, it doesn't take much to, for a golfer to become fickle and decide to go to a different course because the course is in bad condition. But at least responding from having been diligent over the last several months and, and getting to this unfortunate default uh, status, um, I feel having seen the course conditions improve and, and Mr. Rahanek here being here to retool and refocus uh, some of those operations, it's not only just golf, it's food and bev and golf shop operations. You know, we at least have a place now where, you know, we've demanded that they establish some mastery of all three skills uh, to keep going forward. Uh, as it relates to the options that I think this council has, and, and certainly hearing uh, your opinion uh, or position, uh, Councilwoman Valles, with respect to, to default, I, I'm sorry, with respect to ter termination, I think it's very easy to draw that conclusion. I think one of the things that we have for you is options because it's, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the decision we make is the most practical and the most affordable because if we were to effectively try to just terminate today, there's issues in, in the contract that deal with early termination. Uh, there's certainly timing elements that have to be adhered to with respect to noticing and so forth. So uh, rushing into just an absolute termination could, at the end of the day, be, be more um, um, negatively impacting the city than working with this management team, at least getting through this fiscal year, perhaps coming up with a much more uh, meaningful, realistic uh, budget for the uh, forthcoming fiscal year. And because the, the natural term of the contract does terminate 
uh, in uh, June 30 of 2015 use the next nine months of the forthcoming fiscal year to be the true measure as to whether or not what Mr. Rehenick and his team is saying today is actually uh, being met. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, you know, a last draw uh, of the line in the sand, if you will, even though it feels like we've um, uh, rattled the saber uh, previously. I think we have a true opportunity to decide, are we riding the right horse going forward? Because we're, as the owner of the golf course, we're in this, you know, for a long period of time. So I think right now the options that I have before you focus more on uh, the two uh, notice of default issues, which is the physical, and in all three of the options that I'm going to give you, they're deeming the physical uh, default as cured. Uh, I think that's fair given the effort that they've put into the course, but under the first option including that would be a, to allow for the financial default to run through uh, May uh, uh, 15th of, of this year, and that's basically respecting the notice terms in the contract and forcing us to revisit again and um, uh, May of 15 and deciding if we actually want to exercise the default. Uh, option two would be to toll the financial through the fiscal year. That'd give us enough opportunity um, to see if they meet the targets uh, for the fiscal, also respecting some of the contract terms with respect to notice and, and actual default. Uh, but notwithstanding that, there's going to be issues with respect to the early termination that we'll have to uh, deal with. And early termination can amount to as much as uh, 94000 almost almost $100,000 just in, in termination fees altogether. Or, uh, finally, uh, deem the financial satisfied at least through the fiscal year and requiring the remaining nine months uh, of the next fiscal year as the true measurement year, uh, coming up with a realistic budget and buying into the, the management program that they've got uh, before us. I want to terminate the contract. Um, Keith, the second option that you mentioned was tolling the termination through? Toll the financial uh, tr uh, notice through the fiscal year, and that will give you the opportunity to um, exhaust the entire 60-day term uh, notice term that's required under the contract. Uh, in the contract, there's a 60-day notice provision that says you have to give them notice of the default, and it's up to them to uh, attempt to cure that default within the 60 days. Right now, we're in the middle of it. Um, and if at the time you get to the 60 days, uh, if you decide that you want to terminate, then the provisions in the contract say you have to give them another 30 days to actually terminate and basically coordinate uh, the transition. You know, the, the real challenge there becomes, you know, if, if we go down that path, also is not just the early termination fee, then there becomes the physical management. We have to make some decisions fairly quickly as to whether or not we want to ride another horse and bring on a new management team. Do we want to take it upon ourselves to do it? Both of which are likely to incur, um, you know, what would be a, uh, amounting to uh, an additional startup cost. So effectively going that route that quickly, you could likely be looking at a termination fee plus startup cost to bring in either uh, an outside third party or ramping up yourself to, to bring on more staff to run the course. Okay, if we don't terminate the contract at this time, how much is it going to cost the, the city? Well, in, in all of those options, you have to make an appropriation of funds to the order of, uh, at minimum, $307,000. So either way, it's costing money. I, either way, it's it's costing money. I think right now, you know, notwithstanding um, uh, all that's been all that's been said, um, you know, I, I, it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you three hundred six thousand dollars just to cure the payables, and effectively, with the new projections and the new management uh, plan for the golf course, what Mr. Rahanek is basically telling us is through the rest of the fiscal year. It's only going to cost an additional twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars plus or minus uh, to at least get us through the fiscal year. So, uh, you know, I think those are the numbers that you really need to compare from a dollars and cents standpoint as to to, to which route you want to go. Either way, it's still an expense. To me, if if you want a contract, why do you keep asking us for more money? I mean, take away from your profits. It's simple. If you want to keep a contract, why keep coming up here and asking us for more money? take less profit and use that. We don't specifically take a profit from the golf course. We're hired to manage the golf course. We have deferred our fees for many months consecutively to be a good partner and help the cash position of the golf course. Cut your expenses. 
we our our internal expenses are generated uh, by the body counts that support Green Tree. We don't have any hard but dollar your salaries. expenses. I, I suppose we could do that. That's what I would do instead of keep coming back here and asking us for more money. So either we terminate the contract or they figure out how to pay the bills themselves. For what they said they were going to do. What do you want to do? We can't take on the payables of Green Tree Golf Course on behalf of the city. Our, our management fee is a small fraction of that amount. When are we going to stop the bleeding? I mean, I'm tired of staff being wishy-washy with this. They're wishy-washy with this. Somebody needs to just cut it off and let's just cut our losses and move on. They've already proven themselves that they're incapable, that they're incompetent. Yeah, sure, they turned the water on finally when we threatened to terminate the contract. That's still not good enough. I, I don't believe a word they say. I say let's bring on another company. What we do is get out of this contract and um, bring in a staffing agency um, to staff it and use our key personnel management to, to run it until we bring on another company. But we got to stop the bleeding. So I make a motion that we terminate the contract. Are you going to do that on the screen? Oh. All right, so uh, be clear as far as termination is concerned, uh, the, that's the motion on the floor, but it, we still have to comply with termination conditions in the contract. What are those termination conditions? Um, the termination provisions, as I understand them, is that we have to exhaust uh, at least the first 60 days a notice period, which is uh, the notice to cure. Uh, so they have the ability to do that. Um, of the two conditions, uh, staff uh, advises this board that it is cured one. The fiscal uh, has not been cured. So then uh, staff's understanding that resulting from the 60-day uh, uh, elapsing, then you have a 30-day notice of termination. So effectively, that time frame would run you through um, June 15th of uh, this current um, fiscal year, um, if, if that's council's prerogative, then I think we're also going to have to be clear in what we're uh, going to be having to appropriate the funds for. And certainly you're going to at minimum have to appropriate funds to the order of $306,000 to uh, accommodate the payables. I think it's appropriate for you to expect to have to um, consider having to pay the $94,500 early termination fee, notwithstanding any legal expense that likely uh, could be incurred resulting from um, the argument between the parties as to whether or not um, uh, default and termination um, are appropriate. And then notwithstanding that, uh, there's going to have to be a, a, a lot of time and effort by staff to either bring on that third party or decide the most prudent way of taking it on itself uh, altogether. I think you know, the termination route is going to be the more expensive route in the short term um, with no real um, sense of optimism as to an ability to resolve this problem um, in, in the intermediate or even into the long term. And I think with that being said, you're in the golf business. Um, we've lost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars before. This has never been a winning proposition for the city. Um, so, so with that, you know, I think uh, at least as it stands today, you know, we certainly see um, probably the most fiscally prudent uh, uh, advice we could offer to the council would be to continue um, at least uh, through the fiscal year and allowing the uh, remaining year on the contract to be the true measurement year to where we effectively would look around the end of the first quarter of 2015 to decide if in fact we're going to perfect the termination of the contract and that would actually give us probably the right planning opportunity to bring in a new team. I think the, the best way to get our business back and improve business is to hang a banner under new management. And the sooner we do that, the better off that golf course will be. Unfortunately, I don't think our code allows us to hang banners anymore, but 
<laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. All right. Um, we have a second. We have a second, so uh, City Clerk. Mayor, for the record, I just want to correct something or, or correct something for Keith's benefit. As to the termination fee, I think there's a question as to whether there's a cancellation fee in the contract. I think there's some question as to whether or not we would be on the hook for that based on whether or not they would have the ability to cure the monetary default. That he couldn't do it. He still has some time to do it either way. I think when we, we, get, we do this, let's see how fast they react. Our, the vote now? Yeah, there, there is a motion on the floor. The motion is to terminate the contract. Motion by Council Member Vias, second by Council Member Garcia. Motion carries with Mayor Cox and Council Member Kennedy absent and Mayor Pro Tem McEachern voting no. Okay, so I want to go forward. I imagine staff will work with Billy Casper as far as what that means and what needs to be done. And um, with respect to the additional appropriation, Doug, is that going to come back in some sort of formal action to the council? Because we didn't vote to appropriate any money tonight. I understand that there are payables due. Uh, there are organizations that have already complained to both you and I, as well as other members of the council, that they have not been paid. Um, and I don't want local businesses that have been doing business uh, with our golf course not to, to, to go unpaid. So how are we going to uh, deal with that? And where is this money going to come from that was not budgeted? Uh, well, the, the money can come from uh, available funds in the general fund that were unallocated. Um, the uh, I know of several different sources of additional revenue that have come in. Uh, most recently, the Sheriff's Department uh, sent us a check for $850,000 or so as a refund for workers' comp uh, rebates, essentially. So I know that money is there uh, that uh, could be used for an additional appropriation. The Council uh, does have the option. We included it in the, in the subject just to cover our bases if the council wanted to make an additional appropriation now to cover that. Uh, you could do that as a separate vote, I believe. don't want to speak for the attorney, but um, or we also have uh, upcoming this month um, two more meetings, uh, one on the 22nd, one on the 29th. They don't deal with this issue, but uh, uh, those meetings, we I believe we could add an additional appropriation if that uh, what the council would prefer. I think staff's preference uh, would be to give an estimate for an additional appropriation now uh, that would at least cover uh, those payables as well as uh, some additional dollars. Uh, we can make an estimate. Keith, I'm going to say $350,000. Um, correct me if you think I'm wildly wrong here. But that will at least give us the money that we need to, to start making the preparations uh, to, uh, to transition uh, and then also give us the money that we would need to cover those payables. And, and I did talk with the CFO today for the city, and at least to the, what was being requested, the 332 uh, was certainly represented by the CFO as being available from unappropriated fund balance of, of the general fund. Um, so, so the request would be 350 to cure the payables and have money set aside to deal with transitionary. I think that would be uh, best guess we have right now. Um, and uh, as we you know, continue through the fiscal year, if additional dollars are necessary, we'll bring that back as a separate item. Separate and, item. and I think that would be certainly advisable from the transition perspective. I mean, if, if we don't make an appropriation, you know, I, I trust that, that BCG will still remain professional, but you never know the ultimate risk. And what if the doors are closed tomorrow because payables are outstanding? I, I just it'd be you're really putting ourselves in a really tough place to, to deal with that that financial issue it's probably best then that if this is the route that we're going then let's let's clear the books all right then I would like to make the motion that we appropriate the additional 350,000 to cure those payables and have money uh, available for the transition if can we do this without it being agendized it is part of the agenda it's on the staff report uh, providing for the additional appropriations 
But I will need a voice vote on this item. All right, so I make the motion. There's so we're basically saying we're going to clear the books of that 350,000. Right, there's a 306 to 307,000. I'm not sure the exact number of uh, payables due right now. Uh, so this would cover that and then set aside some dollars because obviously this uh, city staff didn't budget for this to at least get us started towards the transition. Don't know what it'll look like. As we know, have further detail uh, in the future, we'll bring it back. Uh, but that would at least uh, allow for some expenses as we get started down that path. Okay. I move. I second. Uh, just for clarification, Mayor Pro Tem McEachern actually made the, the motion. I, I don't care. That's why <laughs> they can okay. make okay. I'll defer okay. to council members. So. Motion by council member Vias, second by council member Garcia. All in favor? Aye. 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 And there are no opposed. Very unanimously. Two absent. All right. Uh, that's the order. So I'd ask that at least you work with our city staff on the transition uh, process. At this you point have our assurance that we will remain professional and cooperative through the transition process. Uh, respect the responsibility that this group has to your community. Uh, we deal with a lot of municipalities. We know how important this is to you. Uh, we are sensitive to uh, your disappointment in the financial results. As this is a matter of public record, I'd like to go on record just staying, stating we were charged with running the golf course for less than it cost to run it before and increasing revenues at the golf course. We did that. We did not do that to the extent that we collectively would have liked to have seen. The golf market is primarily what we can point to. It is uh, prevalent throughout the United States. Golf is a declining sport. Uh, it is a tough business to be in. As you own a golf course in this market, as I think has been alluded to repeatedly this evening, the losses will continue. Uh, it's the scale of the losses we're talking about, and I am proud of the work that this team did. Uh, they are not empty suits. They are human beings, and they put heart and soul into the operation of the facility, and uh, I thank them publicly for their effort in this, this community. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are done with agenda item number 11. Is our mayor still here? Or should I go ahead and move into uh, public comment? Coming back in. So I will turn the meeting back over to Mayor Cox. Public comment. Thank you, Ryan. And we're on item what? I guess I'm ready to adjourn the meeting. No. <laughs> no just public comment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this time is the on the agenda is E1 public comments on items of interest uh, to the public. We had several cards. I don't know which ones were used in the last presentation, but those individuals who want to address the council at this time, um, you can come to the microphone, give your name. Please uh, keep your comments to th three minutes. I will again try to explain. Uh, some people make presentations to the council under the public comment section and get frustrated because they don't get an answer. But when we agendize items, possibly the one that the council just heard, the public knows about it and can appear and talk about that item, but when people get up and talk about an item that's not agendized and there is no information available, it makes it impossible for the City Council to respond, debate, and discuss that item because the public would be cut out of the process. But we do hear you, and we do take into account the comments that you make and the information that you give to the City Council. So at this time, um, the first card that I have, Maureen Harbach. You would come up, please. Maureen Harbach. Um, I would like to give my three minutes to my branch manager to speak on uh, about the uh, post office. All right. Uh, do we have a card from you? Yeah. All right, if you'd come up. What's the name, please? 
Okay. I have it right here. Go ahead, Gregory. I'm Gregory, and that's Marin and Drake and Josette. And we're from the post office. Marin and, and Drake, they both work and live in Victorville. Um, I'm here today because we're asking that the council consider putting our resolution on their agenda and stand with letter carriers to say the post office. Contrary to popular belief, the U.S. Postal Service is not broke. Since 2007, a short-sighted mandate from Congress has required the Postal Service to set aside in just 10 years enough money to pay all future health care retirement benefits for the next 75 years something no other public agency or private company is required to do. That means the Postal Service is paying benefits of employees not even born yet. Uh, this quarter's $765 million operating profit compares with the $100 million from the first quarter of 2013, another sign of improving postal finances. In light of these results, lawmakers should strengthen the postal network while addressing the remaining problem, the congressional mandate to prefund future retiree benefits required of no other public or private entity in America. Degrading the network and reducing services to the public and businesses would jeopardize the postal turnaround. Okay, the U.S. Postal Service is more than just a postal service. It's a vital network that connects every single American home and business six days a week and delivers directly to your door. No other business in America can say it connects customers as well. Small businesses, along with many Americans, particularly seniors, depend on the postal service for receipt of their prescri prescription drugs, primarily delivered on Saturdays. Nobody knows your neighborhood better than your letter carrier. Countless lives have been saved, children and pets returned safely, crimes prevented and reported, all because your letter carrier is there six days a week. Letter carriers are the eyes and ears of every neighborhood in America, and they're often the only human contact to elderly customers who are unable to leave their homes. The Postal Service is poised to make an epic comeback. We need Congress to enact a limited set of sensible reforms and then get out of the way. Okay, in Victorville, since November, we've hired 15 new letter carriers. And why would you want to lose these jobs? Why would you want to degrade the network? And there's a bill in Congress right now, 1486, and if it passes, it will eliminate door-to-door -door delivery. Everyone will have a central delivery. And uh, how would you like your grandmother or your mother to have to walk down the street to pick up her mail every day? And they also have a provision in there to eliminate Saturday delivery. Most of our medicines are delivered on Saturday. Now I have a list of around 28 other cities that have joined the resolution, have passed the resolution, and we'd like you to stand with your letter carriers. And the, in the new hirees, 25% of those new hirees are veterans. So thank you for letting me speak, council members, and uh, I will forward to the city clerk the resolution, and I hope you guys would uh, put it on your agenda and pass it and stand with letter carriers ac across California. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Lamont. And uh, Greg Sheets, I understand that you, ought to, you didn't want to comment. You wanted to have him speak on your behalf. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, card that I have in the order that I received him, uh, Carlos Rodriguez, Re affiliate Baldy Mesa, View Chapter of the BIA. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Cox, uh, members of the City Council. My name is Carlos Rodriguez with the Building Industry Association, Baldy View Chapter. I uh, want to take a moment to uh, thank uh, the Mayor for his letter uh, that we received on March 25th, uh, inquiring about uh, our comments uh, in relation to uh, the all-important issue relative to uh, the down zoning proposal for lot sizes, uh, as well as design standards. Uh, it really was a good message I could send to our uh, members that uh, the city is uh, interested in our perspective. And as I've responded in our 
uh, April 1st letter, uh, we would indeed have our design standard comments and recommendations today, and I wanted to submit them uh, to you personally. We understand that, uh, that you cannot comment in, in, in uh, regards to tonight, but we did uh, want to have, along with our, uh, me personally delivering our uh, recommendations and comments, um, a respectful request uh, for the council moving forward, uh, speaking of having uh, items on the agenda in the future. Uh, we, we would really like to see a holistic um, discussion about this issue, not just our design standards. Certainly on April 29th when there is a scheduled workshop uh, before the council on higher value residential and prettier, cleaner community with pride of ownership, that's the title of the workshop, we would respectfully request the opportunity in the same way that there was a, a give and take discussion on the issue of golf and a presentation presented to the council, we would also uh, request the opportunity to present for 20 minutes uh, before the council during that workshop to highlight and summarize uh, our design standards, comments, and recommendations. We also want to personally uh, urge the city council to coordinate with us on a, a tour of communities to allow there to be greater than seeing what's on paper, actually venturing down to a community and seeing firsthand what we are proposing in a, in a real community. Uh, secondly, uh, as part of the 29th, we respectfully request the opportunity for a separate presentation. Speaking of a holistic discussion, we, we know public safety is a, a vital issue and has been highlighted by staff during a, a recent presentation. The opportunity for Dr. John Worrell to present a white paper to the City Council on the issue of um, the public safety implications on, on the lot size proposal. And Dr. Worrell is a, a current um, head of the criminology program at the University of Texas at Dallas and a former faculty member at Cal State San Bernardino. Lastly, we would respectfully request on May 6th, the uh, next scheduled council meeting, the opportunity for Dr. John Husing to present an economic study regarding the implications of the down zoning proposal. Uh, and, and again, we believe this holistic uh, discussion, not only on the design standards that we're proposing, but also looking at the public safety component, as well as uh, yes. the economic implications have to wrap are, up, Mr. Are, are vital to this discussion. So we would hope that uh, we would have the opportunity, the same opportunity that was afforded today on the golf topic to uh, be extended to the building industry moving forward. We look forward to meeting with Doug Robertson and his staff uh, quickly uh, and uh, rolling up our sleeves and talking about these design standards. We want to be a part of the solution, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. We take seriously the goals that have been outlined in January, and we believe that we can be a part of meeting a higher quality development uh, as has been set out and set as a course of uh, what you guys want to see happen. We believe we can deliver that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dan Tate. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm here to talk about the staff report that recommended the down zoning from a blanket down zoning of R1 to R, R1 to R1 10,000. And first, I'd like to say that there, there seems to be some hostility where it's us against them. And that could be further from the truth. Because as a almost 30 year resident here that's coached 62 baseball, soccer, football teams, someone who's donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to this community. I care about this community. And I know my colleagues in the building industry care about this community. And simply what they do is they, they answer the market demand for housing. And I'd, I'd really like us to lessen this us against them and build this collaboration that says, let's come together, let's pull together experts you know, industry experts in this, because city of Victorville is not the only city going through this issue. This is happening across the country. And please forgive, there's no negative, uh, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but the city's trying to make a decision and they don't have the qualifications to make this decision. There's experts out there that are doing this right now across the country and solving problems, and we've not consulted with any one of them. In my research over the last two months on this issue, I have found four significant issues affecting crime and the quality of life. U.S. Census Bureau shows that there's 31,500 single-family detached homes in the city of Victorville. Of those, 11,500 are rentals. 
Of those 11,500 rentals, 937 are Section 8. So I think Section 8 has been mischaracterized as being a contributor to the problem. I think our problem is absentee owners and, on rentals. And I think that the city should consider adopting a, a business license, $150 a year, whatever, arbitrary, I'm just coming up with a number, $150 a year times 11,000 is, is 1.3 million bucks. That money would fund two code enforcement officers dedicated solely to maintaining and enforcing rental properties. It's a good solution as opposed to kicking the, uh, the, the, the economic engine that feeds this area, that's built this city hall. I mean, build, builders' fees built this city hall. The city didn't build it. And now we're getting ready to, to punch them in the gut and say it's your fault? It's our fault. So we got rentals. Study after study will say that for every direction in the API score of the local high school, housing prices correspond 1 to 6%. API goes down, housing values go down. API goes up, they move in concordance. Victor Unified School District. Ten seconds, Mr. T. Well, I'm not going to be able to finish that, so there's too much. I'd like to, to follow up on what Carlos said. We can only get through this on having an open dialogue, not a one-way conversation with three-minute uh, discussions. So I respectfully request that we do have a public workshop where our experts are allowed to make their presentations and have a back-and-forth dialogue that's not limited in, the, in our contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, for clarification, these items are not agendized. Therefore, for individuals who want to submit information to the City Council or where we know that we're going to have a meeting to discuss the matter, it will be fully discussed. Every individual will have adequate time to present their, uh, their, their presentation, and also they can submit uh, to the Council and to the staff. Uh, in this item where it is not a public item, it is not agendized, no one can anticipate what's going to discuss, it I know the individuals feel a little constrained that they're limited on the time, but it doesn't go anywhere. It, it's not a matter on the agenda, and it's not a public discussion. It is a public comment, very much like writing a letter of, to the daily press expressing your opinion. Um, next is Josetta Meals. Is that correct? Come on up, please. Good evening, council members. I don't ask for anything. I don't want anything. I am a United States Postal employee. I am affiliated with the NALC, which is a national association of letter carriers. That is my branch president. Today I'm only here to recognize the upcoming food bank, the upcoming food drive that's here May 10th, 22nd annual food bank. 22 organizations here in the community. I'm very strong in community. I've lived here since 1968. I've been a carrier for 25 years. I've been organizing and being the liaison between your communities and your post office and NALC members. I work with the community closely. I take all the community. We have a food drive that um, all of us carriers pick up food. Um, each bag, each year. Our bags are donated from funding. This year it's Caremore, it's the Animal Shelter here in Apple Valley, it's also United Way. We are run nationally, nationally in the, in the U.S. continent. We average 74 million food for the homeless, for the pantries, for the shelters. We bring the food in from behind the post office and it's divvied out um, to all the organizations here locally. Okay, uh, I just want to make the uh, community aware of it. I'm a community advocate. I've been working for the food bank for a very long time. In fact, the High Desert Community Food Bank is one of my organizations. I started in January. The food bank and, and the running of the food bank ends in May, but we're year round. Um, I do have buttons for the uh, council members for this year. And if anybody is interested, you can always go in the back of any of the four post offices here locally, Apple Valley, Adelanto, Victorville, and uh, Hesperia. Last year, in 2013, Victorville brought in 16,771 pounds of food that went to six organizations. 
In 2012, 23,438 pounds. All of these stay locally. None of the food goes down below. I make sure of that. In 2011, 17,403 pounds stayed up here. We also bond together with the rescue mission. We also serve um, uh, feed my sheep. There's, like I said, 22 organizations. I just want the board members to be made aware. This year, we're gonna be standing on the corners the day before the food drive, just for advertisement. It will be in your newspaper and it will be on your TV set. This year, it'll be in value packs and it'll also be on your actual advertisements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Robert Harriman. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm gonna be real brief. Um, I was interested in having, uh, uh, exploring the feasibility of a traffic signal on the corner of Amethyst and North Star. Uh, presently, Amethyst is one of the busiest traveled streets, residential, Victorville, and every intersection from Bear Valley Road to Palmdale Road has a traffic signal, except this one. There are bus stops at this intersection, <clears throat> and I obviously don't have the numbers, but I'm willing to bet there's more than 10,000 vehicles that pass through that stop sign every day. So. Uh, I would like to get, uh, see if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if uh, the uh, traffic gentleman, I forgot his name, or if it's possible that uh, uh, some kind of, you know, I know they lay down something on the ground to make sure they can have a, an accurate uh, data on the traffic flow there and that type of thing, if we could uh, do something about that because there's, in the morning, there's, there's probably 100 kids that walk across the street that doesn't even have uh, crosswalks. And that's all residential housing in there. There's two buses that uh, are picking up and dropping off kids every day right there. And like I said, every intersection from Bear Valley Road to Palmdale Road does have a traffic signal except that one, and that is the first one uh, people have to navigate from Bear Valley Road. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Jim Lindenberg. Mayor, Councilman, staff members, thank you. I was going to speak on the sign ordinance, or on the sign ordinance, <laughs> tell you my trials and tribulations of what I've found in the last two months, but I'm glad to hear it's going to be sent back for reconsideration and Maybe there should be some further guidance to how that should proceed. The side door has been around for a long time, and it's been status quo for about 20 years. I've been in business for 20 years. There's been really no enforcement other than what people are doing now. Uh, I'm not totally against the auto dealers of doing it. I'm fighting that battle because that's the battle that was put in front of me. Uh, why can't it be the same for all businesses? Maybe their signs can be a lot bigger because they got bigger buildings. Why can't I have a smaller banner? So I'm looking forward to some further guidance on that. And Mayor Pro Tem, you can have a grand opening sign and a new management sign. Just have to get the forms from planning and give them a hundred bucks, and you can do it for thirty days. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you for that very much. <laughs> Jim, you would know. <laughs> Those are all the cards that I have. Um, uh, having no other cards and nobody else uh, approaching the podium, thank you very much for uh, your comments. Uh, again, sometimes we really want to comment or answer, we just can't, but we do hear it and we go to the staff when necessary. And in most instances, people who do speak do forward information to our city clerk or to me and it ends up with the council. And in many instances, it is agendized and discussed at a later time. That ends the public comment section. The rest, uh, the rest, the next item, E2, is a report from the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, this past Saturday we had our uh, biannual uh, community cleanup day. We had uh, 650 volunteers pick up uh, 7.88 tons of trash. There was uh, 24 different groups working at 24 different locations around the city, so we want to thank them. Uh, this upcoming Saturday, it's a busy, busy time for us is the egg, egg, I can't say this, egg extravaganza at Hook Park. We're not allowed to say Easter, so it's, it's an egg hunt. It's the egg extravaganza. 
clarification. You may not be able to say it, but I can. Okay. But I have no hesitancy. In okay. It. If you'd like to call it an Easter egg hunt. It's an Easter egg hunt. Okay. That was the mayor. Um, anyway, it's from 9 to 2. Uh, and uh, we usually have two to two to three thousand people come to that event. It's a fantastic event with kids running all over the place, having a good old time. So, uh, invite you to come out to that. It's actually put on by our uh, community services youth advisory committee, which has a student representation from each one of the high schools uh, in Victorville uh, on that committee that puts that on. And we, we of course, thank them for that. Uh, lastly, um, the traffic signals on La Mesa. The three new signals are now on and working red yellow green maybe not in that order maybe the other way around um, and so be advised of that uh, enjoy them on your way home if you happen to go that way uh, i did get an update from my wife who updates me daily uh, as to whether or not they're working yet and she got three green lights and she was thrilled there you go <laughs> there's no red light cameras at those intersections either oh. that's why she didn't get a red light <laughs> thank you uh, doug uh, reports from the council members. I'll start on my left with Council Member Garcia. Uh, I have nothing. Ms. Uh, yeah, just one thing. Uh, the county is having their Give Big San Bernardino County uh, online giving campaign on May 8th. I'll hand out uh, one of these little flyers that we got. Uh, I put the challenge out to the West Valley and the east end of the county um, at Sandbag that uh, the Mountain Desert Division would give more, so I'd encourage you to spread the word, uh, otherwise I'll have to eat mine. So, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Baez. Uh, I have some concerns about uh, the rave party, the 420 party that's going on. Um, the Daily Press um, made it sound like in the first article that that the city, the city allowed it because it, it was comments from, I guess, the people putting on the event thanked the city for allowing them to have such events. Um, when I called the city manager, he, he made it clear to me that they didn't approve any event. We don't have any rights to approve the event. Um, they're a completely separate entity. It is a fair board that approves the event. Um, and. It's handled, from what I understand, like any other event, like if it was the fair, they can have it. Um, we don't care for them to have it, but if uh, they want to, they can do it, and that's what they did. And I wanted to ask the um, city attorney, is there anything that we can do to stop these events from occurring? Because they're not safe. We have looked at the issue in the past and had issues with it in the past. The problem here is it is on county property. It's the fair board, I believe, is actually even appointed by the state, and I think it's deemed to be state property, um, not even county property technically. So I gladly will look at it again and see if there's anything that can be done in the short term, but typically these are uh, county fair board sanctioned events on what is essentially state property, I believe, Doug's state Yeah, that, that's correct. It is state property. Uh, two years ago, uh, we sent a letter of opposition to a rave they had at that point in time. Um, whether they choose to call it a rave or not is immaterial. Um, that letter also indicated that uh, if there's any damage or uh, property damage or, or any other costs incurred by the city uh, outside of, of those grounds, that we would uh, pursue those uh, through any and all legal action uh, that we deem necessary. So um, certainly the city hasn't supported them. Um, I think some of the support comments may have been confused by a conversation that our uh, sheriff's captain and I had with the current general manager. Uh, just for the record, I did share that letter with him. Um, but uh, essentially what uh, I agreed reluctantly was that uh, for officer safety reasons, uh, that if they are going to have an event, uh, it's best for that security be, to be provided uh, by deputies through the Victorville stations so that they have some continuity of radios and channels. Um, two years ago, uh, when this came up uh, previously, uh, there was discussion about them using possibly the Highway Patrol, uh, even LAPD, I believe, was called at one point, uh, and uh, there was uh, tremendous concern because if an incident happened, um, they would not necessarily have quick access through the radios to the county sheriff who ultimately has, has that responsibility. So uh, I don't know that that would qualify as support necessarily. It was, uh, I think, the lesser of evils. Um, so this leads me to my next question, and this has been a question I've had for a couple of years now regarding 
um, the fares, unpaid taxes that they have from their little um, satellite gambling outfit out there. Um, we went after the um, hotels and made them pay up. Um, and I, I'd like this to be agendized, and I think that the fair need the fair board needs to pay up. I mean, there's a lot of money owed, and they need to pay it. I can uh, make another appointment with the fair manager. That was another topic of that discussion was uh, that paramutual betting and the monies that uh, we believe are owed to the city as a result. Um, and uh, he indicated he was going to go back and take a look at uh, whatever legal counsel they received at the time that indicated that they could uh, retain those funds themselves. And I have not heard back from him, but I will certainly make inquiry with him and let him know that it was a topic of conversation at tonight's meeting and ask him for an update. That's all I have. Uh, thank you, Council Member Vice. I, I concur. I know that the, the, the state cut funding and they had difficult times. Um, we overspent. We had difficult times. I can't think of anybody that was forgiving us for our debts uh, or the people who lost their jobs. In fact, courts were full of legal action being taken against people who were on hard times too. But for us to not take an action, I don't think we're carrying out our public responsibility to collect money that is owed to the city. And so if it's okay with the council before we agendize this and take some kind of action, is it okay for the city manager to immediately meet with the powers that be and report back to the city council, and then we can determine what action we want to direct our city attorney to take? Yes, if he reports back at the next meeting. You got it? Seems reasonable. Um, I'm the last member to speak on these issues, uh, on any issues. I just want to make a comment on the environmental issues. Uh, I have said on several boards that were primarily to protect the environment. I've never known anyone that's not really an environmentalist in a lot of ways. Uh, no one wants to poison the air or the water. Um, they want to kind of preserve this planet for our future generations. Um, but when I sat on a board that was technically a state board, I was amazed at the legislation that came out of Sacramento and the things that we had to do. And I was amazed that somebody would even introduce a bill, let alone get it passed. But then it becomes a state law and there is compliance. We spend, as a public agency, a tremendous amount of money uh, for individuals that make a living filing lawsuits over environmental issues and also acquiring land that will never be used for uh, what the statement is for, such as the ground squirrels, the Mojave ground squirrel. If you listen very carefully, once you pay the money, you can destroy the animal. That doesn't make any sense. And I've, I've heard a two-hour presentation on why that's necessary, uh, but I haven't heard uh, to date a presentation on why it's necessary to preserve it to begin with. In the history of this earth, there have been literally millions of species that have gone by the wayside, and I don't know that we're any worse off for it. Uh, not that I want to kill anything but we reached the point of being absolutely ridiculous and we have such a shortage of public money. We actually have a very conservative council. We don't like raising fees. We don't like reaching into the money. We want to have more policemen. We want to have a better city. We want to have better roads. And we're paying huge amounts of money annually for items that don't exist and to quell lawsuits that people simply take advantage of the way legislation is written. We didn't write it. You hold us accountable. Please hold your state elected officials accountable in the same way. That concludes this meeting. Thank you very much for coming and participating in this meeting, and good night. Safe trip home.